Hey guys, I'm Steve, uh, an entomologist in Japan, and what I've just captured here is a an antlion adult, family Mermeliontidae. Let's see if we can get a in focus shot here. Now I'm here in sort of rural. Uh, rural area in Japan, uh, sort of the countryside of Tokyo in Saitama Prefecture. And just sort of walking through these woods here, uh, just sort of on the edge of the local town, and just trying to see what I can find. So we'll walk around a little bit and see what's out here. Maybe some large beetles. I don't know, various caterpillars, uh, certainly a lot of mosquitoes. Uh, I didn't bring my insect repellent, so we'll have to make do with that. Um, but look at this really beautiful antlion. If I can get it in focus again, there we go. Not sure if this is a male or female. It could be a female. And of course, you know the juveniles uh, typically make these pits in the sand, uh, which they capture their prey when they fall in. Uh, not all ant lions do that, but most of them you'll see sort of in arid regions, dry areas where there's overhanging vegetation or rocks. You'll see those pits underneath. Uh, and that's where the juveniles will catch their prey. There are other insects as well. There's another family uh, of insects that makes these types of pits. So it's not always an antlion pit. It's a very pretty antlion adult. We'll let it go again. There we go. So guys, I was just walking on the path here and they're hard or easy to miss sometimes because they're just sort of sitting on top of foliage during the day, uh, looking around for uh, meal items. Now they're not predators per se, they're more scavengers, but they're just here perching on top of the leaves. It's that right there. If you haven't seen these before, this is a scorpion fly in the order Macoptera. Uh, this particular one is in the family Panorpidae. Uh, there aren't that many families of scorpion flies, and in fact, in the order Macoptera, there's maybe about 600 species worldwide. Um, but of course, new ones are being discovered, uh, particularly in areas of China right now. Um, and this particular one is a female. So if you look at the end, if you look at the end of the abdomen, let's see if I can point, sort of on the right side, they have very interesting behavior too. They wave their wings around. But if you look on the right side of the body at the tip of the abdomen, you'll see it's kind of tapered. And so that's a female, uh, the ovipositor is there. Um, you see, these, these ones don't get startled very easily. In other parts of the world, um, when you go near scorpion flies, they tend to be very quick to flight. Uh, so you really have to be rather quick with your net to catch them. Uh, but this one, you know, I'm just about a foot away from it. 
and it's uh, pretty docile. Just sort of relax in there. So with scorpion flies, you notice too that they have these, their two antennae are quite long. And you'll notice the front of the head is rostrate. So it has a, oh, there we went. I think there's another one over here. So they have a, an extended part of the head that's called a rostrum. And at the tip are the mouth parts. Oh, and here's, there we go. There's a male. And you'll see why they call them scorpion flies. So the tip of that abdomen is curled and the male genitalia are at the tip. And so when it's resting, it sort of resembles a scorpion. Look at that. They're very beautiful. This is a species I haven't seen uh, in Japan yet. Another one, which is perhaps more striking than this one, is about twice as large as, as this one and it has this really striking black and red uh, coloration. Uh, but here in Saitama, I haven't come across that yet. Doesn't mean they're not here, but I just haven't seen them. So you'll just, they're really, really interesting to watch you know, as they just sort of wave their wings around. I'm not sure why they do that. Perhaps they're just always staying ready to fly, or perhaps they're always searching for mates, uh, which is also likely. They tend to come out during specific times of the year. Um, in the U.S., it's, it's a pretty short window of time at which they, they emerge. And during that time, of course, they have to feed, look for mates, and then the female has to deposit the eggs. Scorpion flies, yeah, they're really cool. Uh, I certainly like watching them. So I, if I haven't uh, mentioned already, welcome to Insectamundi. And like I said, we're just kind of walking around looking for various insects. There's a spider web right here. Okay. I almost crashed into it. So lots of these uh, Nephila spiders. Let's see. It's hard to focus on this one. Anyway, let's see what else we can find. It really is pretty striking abundance of insects, particularly at night. The forest is just a really daunting chorus of, of insects. It's, it's really quite amazing, uh, particularly the insect, uh, not the, the insect, the cicadas. Uh, the cicadas here just have all sorts of different sounds, and it's really, it's really a fantastic experience to listen to them. Well, on this tree here, actually, we walked past. You can see this is the what looks like an old mantid egg case. It's a, the juveniles hatched perhaps earlier in the summer, or maybe last year. And then just above it, actually, is another type of insect. Uh, not a mantid, but it's in, it's a pupil case. And you'll see it's attached at the top with some silk. Uh, this one also is an expired pupil case. Um, but these are made, and they come in all sorts of different sizes. Uh, these are made by a particular family of Lepidoptera, or moths. 
and that family is called Psychidae. Uh, and the, co the common name is uh, bagworm moths. And the females will construct these bags. Uh, the females often being sort of neotenic, uh, meaning they're not, they, their, their body sort of takes on a juvenile form, more like a caterpillar. And so they're typically, although they're not, not always, uh, but they're typically wingless and they might stay in these bags. And the female, uh, sorry, the males will come along uh, with wings, will fly along, uh, usually picking up on some pheromone cues, will fly to the female and inseminate her, uh, sort of in her sleeping bag here. Um, and then often the eggs are just laid in the in the bag, in the hatch. Pretty interesting. Bagworm moths. And you'll see, although I try to uh, use common names, I'm actually not that great with common names. Um, there are a lot of common names for insects. And the trouble with common names, though, is that they're they're only common to the society in which they're used. So, you know, in the U.S., there's common names for various insects, although most, I would say most insect species don't have common names in the U.S. When you come to Japan or any other country, there's a whole new set of common names. Okay, so, and, and they typically do not overlap at all. So, you know, try to really stay clear of using common names, although they, you know, they can be useful, of course. Oh, there's another a male scorpion fly, sort of in its natural habitat here. Its typical pose, waving its wings a little bit. It's a little windy. And that's also a male. But anyways, yeah, I've tried not to use too many common names. Oh, take an example. Uh, weevils, for instance. Uh, you know, they're a group of uh, beetles. And weevil is the name used in the United States. Um, but it really doesn't have any particular meaning. So when you come to... Ooh, there's a giant hornet. flying around a bit fast. Earlier I saw one of these giant hornets catch another, what looked like, I'm not sure which wasp, but it looked like another wasp in the family Vespidae, which the, the hornets are also a part of. And it caught it in midair, which is what they do. They're just flying around looking for other insects to eat so they can then uh, essentially uh, sting them which renders them helpless okay it paralyzes them and then they'll bring those prey items back to the nest uh, so the larvae can feed on them uh anyway what, what was i saying oh weevils so if you go to a place like japan or china east asia uh they obviously obviously they, they don't use the name weevils uh, they're called, the translation would be snout beetle or uh, elephant beetle. So, but the, the scientific names are always consistent. So, you know, you try to use those. And when you use the scientific names, if you become more familiar with uh, the classification, I thought I saw something become more familiar with the classification 
and uh, how the different groups are related, using the scientific names is it's more it's, it's more useful. Okay. Uh, but with common names, you know, you say this is a uh, you know, uh, a mud dauber doesn't really say much in terms of relationships. You don't particularly know what it is until you see the actual organism. But anyways, all right, let's continue. See what else we can find. Yeah, I've passed over something recently. It was around here somewhere. Look at this, there's mosquitoes everywhere. Mosquitoes are actually quite interesting themselves, although being quite pesty, of course. Um, they can be really beautiful. Now, these ones look to be 80s Egypti, with tiger, tiger mosquito. Um, but aside from being really pesty and transmitting lots of diseases, um, very significant diseases like malaria, yellow fever, and such. Mosquitoes themselves are really quite beautiful, particularly when you look under the microscope. And that's because their bodies, much like uh, lepidopterans, uh, moths and butterflies, they're covered with scales. And so they can be really striking in terms of their patterns. And not all of them feed on blood either. Um, most of them, particularly, or the males always, will feed on nectar from flowers or these types of uh, sugar uh, resources. And so, you know, really only a few genera of mosquitoes feed on mammalian blood, while the rest of them are harmless to humans. They feed on nectar and such. And there can be some really big mosquitoes. For example, one genus called Toxorhynchites, um, you know, reaches maybe two centimeters in length. And they're really striking uh, in coloration. They can have, the, the scales can be red, a metallic red, metallic green, metallic blues, uh, yellows, really pretty um, and they do occur in the United States um, but they're more sort of tropical in distribution well I have mosquitoes all over me all right where was that one thing I was looking for all right well I couldn't find I think it was some sort of uh, it was a lepidopteran caterpillar of some sort but it had a striking horn on its posterior end. And of course, you know, a lot of, some of the, many of the insects maybe that we come across, uh, I may not know what they are. Maybe we can get it down to family level. That's usually pretty good. So anyways, you know, why care about insects? You know, why is this channel featuring insects? Although you know, I do have other stuff, other posts. Why insects, you know? Why other than thinking that they're really interesting or cool. Uh, why should people care? And you know, maybe if you're watching this, you already really think insects are extremely interested, interesting, and you like collecting them or watching them. But not everybody does, of course. And I would say the majority of people are frightened of insects. But you shouldn't be. Um, insects, for one reason, 
are critical in terms of the diseases they transmit. So we need to learn how to deal with them. And particularly, particularly the dipterns, the flies, transmit um, their vectors for all sorts of, of diseases. So they're significant in that regard. But they're also significant in terms of sort of the services, the ecosystem services that they provide. Uh, not only just to the planet, but uh, to humans as well. And those services would be things like uh, decomposition, a decomposition of decaying things. Insects are a major contributor to recycling of nutrients. Um, and they most likely also are extremely significant in the nitrogen cycle. So a lot of them, at least what we're finding right now, a lot of them harbor nitrogen fixing bacteria in their guts, sort of much like plants uh, have these nitrogen fixing bacteria associated with their roots. And so what that does is it takes the nitrogen in the atmosphere and it makes it, it fixes it into a usable compound that can be used by all other organisms on the planet. So it's usually fixed into ammonium. So essentially what comes out in, in waste. Uh, and so particularly soil dwelling insects, but maybe almost all other insects, we don't know for sure yet. Um, they're significant in, in the, the nitrogen cycle and in decomposition. But also, and maybe many people don't think about this, is that insects are crucial in agriculture. Uh, I say agriculture for humans, but they're crucial for plant life, uh, mostly flowering plants, but um, some angiosperms, uh, some gymnosperms as well. They're crucial to plant life because they are responsible for approximately something like 80% of the pollination services are performed by insects. So 80%, this might be slightly high, but around 80% of plants are pollinated by insects. So you can think about this in terms of crops and agriculture, okay? They're extremely significant. There are some uh, crops, of course, that are pollinated by the wind, uh, things like grasses and sedges. But insects pollinate a lot of plant life on this planet. And so without them, you know, we simply would perish. Okay. A good example might be if you think about uh, figs. There's several hundred uh, species of fig trees, and these are only pollinated by tiny microhymenopterans, okay? Tiny wasps, uh, a few millimeters in length. They're only pollinated by these fig wasps uh, in the family Agionidae. And if you start extirpating, or if these fig wasps start dying out, uh, these fig tree species likely would die out as well. So, you know, insects are extremely important, not only to the functioning of the planet, but to humans as well. And perhaps one item I missed which is usually the obvious one, is insects are crucial 
and various food webs, okay? Uh, you know, insects will predate their predators in various habitats. It depends on the habitat. And in other habitats, insects are fed upon by other predators. So, of course, they're very, they're crucial in food webs. So, that's why, or some of the reasons, at least that I can think of right now, that insects are you know, very important to humans. And is why, you know, even if you're not interested in insects, you should be not aware of these things. You know, not always, you, you, if you see an insect, you don't always have to shriek, you know. <laughs> maybe, maybe you don't want to get stung by, you know, a wasp. Um, or, or some other biting insects. But, you know, appreciating them from afar is always a good thing to do. And maybe if you're able to do that, you know, you can see the beauty in insects. Yeah. So what else can we find here? This is sort of a wooded area. It's been cleared a little bit. So you can usually find a lot of insects hiding in these wood piles and such. And then on these trees, particularly I found in Japan, they might have some sap flues coming down them. And a lot of insects tend to congregate at these sap, sap flues. Right there you can see, it looks like a nymphalid butterfly. Family nymphalidae. Very pretty butterfly. These tend to be quite common in wooded areas. And you can see there's actually quite a lot of ants near this sap flow as well. That's pretty interesting. see they're making their, their foraging lines oh, it looks like over here maybe captured something or maybe that's a dead fungi or something that they're feeding upon oh there's actually a dead cicada right here. You can see the colored wing right there. And they're working on that cicada there. So you might ask, you know, why are they always in these lines? Good question. They, they lay down essentially these trail pheromones, okay? So when, they're, when they find a food source, or before they find a food source, maybe they're foraging in not so straight of lines, okay? But when they do find food sources, they start to lay down their trail pheromones. So the rest of the workers can then come find the food source and bring it back to the nest. Okay. Now, and ants, maybe, you know, people don't think ants are particularly special because they really do dominate a lot of ecosystems, particularly in the tropics. Ants are just everywhere. You really have to be careful where you step in tropical and subtropical areas. Um, I mean, it can be kind of dangerous because uh, there's a lot of pretty aggressive ant species. But they're everywhere, right? 
But if you, if you were to look at ants underneath the microscope or close up, maybe with some sort of magnifying lens, or just go online, right? Nowadays, you can just go online and you can see the splendid, incredible diversity of insects, okay? So you can look for images like uh, scanning electron microscope images of ants or just photographs. And you can see the sculpturing on their body, the ways in which the cuticle, which is secreted by the epidermis, the ways in which the cuticle are sculpted in these sort of magnificent twisting and sort of geometric patterns, it's it's really phenomenal. I mean, you just have to go and, and, and see for yourself. It's really fantastic to look at insect cuticle, um, not just ants, but you know, ants are a good example. If you look at scanning electron microgrowth images of ants, they're really quite splendid. If you look at them close up, you know, highly magnified, you'll see that it just, it looks like a, a Martian surface. It really does look like an alien planet. If you don't know what you're looking at, these highly magnified images of insect cuticles are just fantastic. Maybe that's enough of ants for now, at least this species. Oh, and ants are, of course, they're in the family Formicidae, or Formicidae. Hey guys, here's another, I saw it already, but here's another nymphalid butterfly. One of the good ways to recognize nymphalids is they have very short, they have very short uh, forelegs, and they usually don't perch with them. They're kind of like a Tyrannosaurus rex in that regard. They sort of hold their forelimbs, forelegs, uh, close against the body because they're so short. Uh, one thing I didn't mention regarding the significance of insects as well. Which perhaps is also a really overlooked fact. Is that insects are the most abundant organisms on the planet. And right now there's a million described species, approximately. Just of insects. And the estimated abundance of insects is between maybe two to five million species. And these, this is extant species, so the living species. And this is a conservative estimate. I mean, there might be as many as oh, 10 million. Oh, here's a, uh, just came across, what is this a cootie did, it looks like. No, that's not a cootie did. This is one of those sort of cone-headed, uh, critters it looks like, grasshoppers. Where did it go? Oh, there it is. You see the short antennae uh, sticking out in front of it. I 
Very pretty. But anyways, the conservative estimate of insect species on the planet is, like I say, two to five million. And new insect taxa are being discovered all the time. Some groups of insects, there's thousands and thousands of new species to be described. If you think about maybe gull wasps or various types of fungus gnats. Uh, their diversity, particularly for these groups, when you get into the tropics, their diversity is just staggering. Or when you look at insects collected in the canopies of tropical areas. I mean, you, if you look at some groups of insects, even things like forids or scuttleflies, these little sort of pesty looking flies, but they're very fascinating in their biology. Things like forids, I mean, you'll, you'll get maybe 80% of them collected in the tropics are new species. So you can see how this projection of millions of insect species uh, is not really an exaggeration. It's a pretty good estimate, likely. And again, this is just, this is extant taxa. If you then go back into the fossil record, you know, back in time, there are tens, perhaps hundreds of millions of species that have lived on this planet. Okay. So, in my mind, it really is difficult to ignore the presence of insects, just based on the numbers, right? If you want to try to ignore that insects are these useless pests on the planet, you know, I think you're uh, making a big mistake. And you can just take a few examples. Um, you know, dragonflies and damselflies in the order Odonata. This may be around 6,000 species that have been described. And just take the bird diversity on this planet. I think it's maybe 10,000 species. I might be wrong. That might be for mammals. But let's say 10,000 for birds. It could be 6,000, but let's say 10,000. Uh, you know, there's almost as many dragonflies as there are for the entire group of aves, birds. If you go to more diverse groups of insects, uh, you could just say one family of, or a few families of weevils. Weevils are a super family. They're a group of a few families, but just of weevils, which are a small, which are a large group, but they're one of the many groups of beetles, right? There are maybe around 60,000 described weevil species. You know, that's six times as many species as there are birds just of this one beetle group. So, that might put it into perspective. And, you know, you can go on and on making these comparisons. Uh, so, the taxon abundance of insects is impressive. And, you know, you can really see this in there colors, their forms, their sizes, uh, their different types of life history traits, their biologies, their different s developmental stages, the toxins they produce, the environments they live in. When you get into it, it's, it's a staggering diversity, not just in numbers, but in form, in biology, in function, in physiology yeah. really impressive
came across, I don't know, this is just a dead something. A partially eaten, looks like a carabid beetle. The carabid beetle diversity, or the ground beetles is the common name, but carabidae is really fantastic in Japan. All right, we're continuing to just walk along this kind of trail near some little agricultural field plots. You know, I'd like to advocate um, on this channel, not just insects, although that's what I specialize in, but all forms of organisms on this planet. You know, not just the insect kind. Okay. Or not even just the animal, but the plant life as well. Sure, in the insect life is quite staggering just to think about in its own right. But every group of organism sort of has its own unique diversity in biology. And a lot of it, uh, life on the planet really is understudied. It's not just insects. You can think about other uh, arthropods, you know, other segmented uh, organisms with this hardened exoskeleton. You know, crustaceans, for example, severely understudied groups and their diversity you know, not quite as large as insects but uh, is, re is really staggering in its own right you can think about bacteria and unicellular organisms on this planet I mean their diversity is just amazing and really understudied as well There's new species of plants being discovered all the time. So, yeah, even though I'm focusing on insects, you know, just keep in mind that life on this planet in general is, is pretty amazing. And you just have to go out and observe it. And just sort of immerse yourself in it. And then you can see how truly you know, beautiful and, and interesting it is. At times dangerous, of course, and irritating too, <laughs> in terms of a lot of the dipterns, the flies, but, you know, that's how it is. Being an organism on the planet ourselves. Here's another, looks like a female scorpion fly. This is the, the same species that we saw before. Look at that. Really interesting. You can see its long snout, too. And one of the cool things, well, another interesting thing about scorpion flies is when they're mating, the males will often have what's called a nuptial gift, okay? And what that is, it's this proteinaceous regurgitation of food. It's typically kind of a white color because it's really rich in proteins. And it will regurgitate this nuptial gift on a site where the, the male and female are mating. And it keeps the female busy, for one thing, um, so they can sort of mate to completion, copulate to, complete, com to completion. But it also serves as a rich source of food um, for the developing eggs in the female. Okay. So it's a really interesting behavior, and it's not unique to scorpion flies. It's not unique to Macoptera. There's a lot of other insect groups that do this. Uh, a well-known 
group that does this also is uh, Katie did. Uh, in, in the family, it's Hedegoniidae. They also will produce nuptial gifts. And hopefully you can hear all the different sounds in this, which is really in this sort of shallow forest. Um, a lot of them probably orthopteran sounds. Tree frogs, probably. I haven't heard a lot of... Well, there's some cicada sounds, but it depends on the cicada taxon. Some of them prefer to sing you know, in the mornings, some of them in the evenings. So I'll try to find one. I haven't found one yet. So we'll see if we can nab one. They tend to occur further up in the trees, uh, usually not hanging low unless they just happen to fall or just fly down. So we'll try to find something. Guys, yeah, here's a pretty good find. These, these tend to be quite abundant in Japan too. You see that thing right there? That is a carrion beetle. Where'd it go? Oh my gosh, did I just lose it? Oh, there it is. Looks like a female. You can see it's ovipositor sticking out. Now, carrion beetles, they used to be in their own family still today. Uh, but recently people think that they belong to a sort of basal clade, basal grouping of rove beetles in the family Staphylinidae. And the Staphylinids, sort of similar to we weevils, um, are in enormous radiation of beetles. The Staphylinids contain upwards of 60,000 described species. And their diversity is really staggering as well. Particularly in the forest floor or sort of leaf litter areas. Where'd he go? Or where did she go? And of course, carrion beetles, as their name suggests, uh, they tend to feed on carrion or decaying animal matter. So if you see a dead carcass or some animal or maybe um, some dead insects, you might find, if you turn it over, lots of larvae of carrion beetles. I think I lost it. And you won't just find carrion beetle larvae, you also find uh, other types of larvae as well. Carrion beetle larvae can be pretty distinct. They sort of look like a trilobite in a way. Um, but other types of beetles have these sort of tr trilobite looking larvae as well. So it's not just carrion beetles. And guys, here's a uh, skipper butterfly. It's in the family Hesperiidae. Oops, went. And of course, as its common name suggests, uh, they tend to have this flight pattern that makes them look like they're skipping through the air. Um, so they're really adept flyers. They're usually very fast. And they like to be out in sort of sunny habitats. Looking over here, just right next to it, you'll see a scarab beetle just kind of resting on the leaf. I don't know if it's dead. I don't know, it's alive. You saw its legs were, were um, sort of, its legs were lifted up. That meant it was in its uh, falling position, which a lot of scarab beetles tend to do when they see something. They sort of get in the ready position to fall to the ground so they can't be found. Through there, I saw it looked like a swallowtail butterfly. The family Papillionidae. It's 
see. Still here. See, there's a lot of chestnuts on the ground. Chestnuts are one of the several crops in Japan. Oh, there it is. Look at that beautiful swallowtail. Windy, so. Oh, there it went. Oh, guys, I almost got hit in the head with a chestnut. It just fell. This. is having a bit of a windfall right now. Look at these. The husk of this chestnut. Oof, it's really spiny. Look at this. It's the chestnut that just fell. If you steam that, it'll be a tasty little meal. All right, guys, I was continuing my walk and I just stumbled upon this vegetation looking insect it's trying to blend in. I'm sure most people are familiar with uh, praying mantises or in the family mantidae. I'm not certain what taxon this is. It kind of resembles the Chinese mantis, which is a large species. Their visual acuity, acuity really is quite amazing. Um, they, actual, they actually have a part of their eye which is sort of a focal point when they're looking anteriorly. I guess we sort of startled this one. give you an idea of the size. Put my finger here. Yeah, beautiful. And you see the forelegs have these, are modified into these raptorial grasping appendages. You see these, I don't know if you can see the spines that are located on the uh, ventral side of the what is actually the, the femur where is it let's see if i can point to it it's sort of right there these big spines that they use to ensnare their prey and the cool thing about mantids or really this sort of raptorial nature um, of having these raptorial forelimbs for catching prey. It's not unique to mantids either. There are various, there's some um, different groups. There's a group in Neuroptera. They're called mantis flies. Um, those occur in Japan as well. Maybe we'll find one of those sometime. But these, those have raptorial forelimbs. You have raptorial forelimbs in some uh, true bug groups or in the order Hemiptera. Um, those are the sort of the primary ones I can think of at the moment. But raptorial forelimbs occur in many different insect groups and it's really pretty astounding. Um, and this is really a theme in insects in the whole group of insects which is convergent evolution. And that's where you, just, you have these features, similar features that appear in independent groups. 
So like I mentioned, these raptorial forelimbs, they occur in mantids, but they also occur in other insect groups that are not closely related. And so those are convergent features. Okay. The insects, um, th you know, through evolutionary pressures and processes, they converge on these similar types of features. And so that's different than features that are homologous in evolution. And the homologous features are those that are shared from a recent common ancestor. Okay. So if you think about, the, again, the raptorial forelimbs with dismantid, they're homologous within the mantids. Oh, there just went another one. Oh. I'll show you that. This Katie did flew by. But in mantids, the raptorial forelimbs are homologous within mantids. Okay, They share this feature. Except perhaps some of the uh, extinct primitive mantid groups. But raptorial forelimbs are convergent. If you're comparing the forelegs of mantids and the forelegs of you know mantis flies which also have raptorial forelimbs okay. and again i mean convergent ev evolution in insects is really amazing uh, I'll, most likely and you know you're going to hear me talk about all sorts of other things that are convergent within insects scales being another prominent one so what just flew by here was and it's camouflaged quite well is a katydid okay and you see the very long antennae of the katydid and katydids like crickets and essentially the other long antenna uh, orthopterans. You see, they have their ears are located on their forelegs. And their their hearing is actually quite remarkable. It's actually somewhat similar to mammalian hearing in a way, in which they have various types of CD that can sense sound but they essentially have a tympanum, or like an eardrum on their leg, the foreleg. There it go. There it is. And they hear sound through their forelimbs. But they can hear essentially sounds coming from different directions as well. So there's some directionality to their hearing as well. And it can be quite acute. This particular one is a female. Maybe if you saw when I had a better angle, it has a very large ovipositor. It's kind of sword-like uh, in the back here. Oop. There's that same Katie did. show you the ovipositor. See that? And maybe a lot of the katydids that people might see are these sort of green types. Uh, but katydid diversity, like many orthopterans really, is fantastic. I mean, in the coloration, uh, and all, all sorts of spines that they can have on their body. And in different developmental stages, they can look completely different. Uh, they can have spines in one place, in one stage, and then when they molt the cuticle, uh, they could have spines in a different place and of a different color. So, I mean, Katie, the diversity is really incredible. and including their songs, the, uh, the songs that they produce through stridulation. Um, and this is done with a stridulatory file. 
on their hind leg. Essentially a series of ridges that they rub against um, the edge of their wing. Here's another interesting little uh, hemipteran. And this is a psychedelid, psychedelidae. Uh, plant hopper. Probably a large one, actually. Let's see if I can turn the leaf over and not disturb it. The leaf hopper diversity is really quite amazing as well. And they're typically, some of them are pretty major pests on things like alfalfa. Um, various other types of uh, crops. You can have all sorts of colors of cicadellids. They come in all sorts of varieties. Yeah, r right next to the Cicadella was actually another mantid. You can see it right here. It's a pretty large one. Let's see if it sees me. I guess it's just sort of resting here. Don't want to disturb it too much. It looks like it may have just emerged. Recently emerged because you can see. Uh, one of the forewings there is really kind of wrinkled and small. It could be that when it just emerged as an adult, maybe its forewing dried in that position, which is unfortunate. Sometimes when the insects molt, well, molting can be quite dangerous, uh, but it has to be done, of course. Uh, but all sorts of things can go wrong when an insect molts. You know, sometimes they can't shed their cuticle completely, which can be a problem. If the cuticle is not shed completely in a crucial area, like near one of its uh, spiracles, one of the holes in the body where air goes in and out, uh, that can cause a lot of trouble. Um, if they can't shed the cuticle completely, they could suffocate. So, yeah, I guess you can be glad that as a human, you know, we just kind of shed constantly. We don't shed our, our old epidermis all at once. Uh, oh, the uh, mantid is moving a little bit now. Just leave it on its way. Hey guys, just walking around a little bit more, came across another carrion beetle. Maybe we won't lose this one so easily. They're just wandering around looking for their next meal. to walk some more. I think people probably see these types of blotches on leaves a lot if they walk through the forest. And maybe you don't think much about these, but they're actually pretty cool in how they're made. These are 
essentially feeding marks by some sort of maybe a dipteran uh, fly or perhaps a, a moth. Some beetles do this as well. And what it's what it is 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 it's called leaf mining. And so what happens is the immature stages, usually uh, the, the larva, um, well, the egg actually can be inserted uh, on top, be placed on top of the leaf, or it can be inserted within, in between the, the leaf layers, because a leaf has two epidermal layers, one on top and one on the bottom. And so when the larva hatches, it will feed in between these layers. And so this whitish color, which sort of turns brown later on, is just the empty space within those two layers. And the larva is just feeding on the tissue, the mesophyll, in between the leaf layers. There's actually a whole family of diptera called the leaf mining flies. Agromyzidae is the family that does this. There's also many families of Lepidoptera that do this. Uh, and it's, you know, leaf mining is pretty interesting uh, in several regards in terms of the styles of, of mines that the larvae make. They can be different depending on the taxon. And here's another mantid hiding right there. They can be different depending on the style of, uh, d depending on the taxon that makes it. Um, they can be different in terms of where the larva places its its, its uh, excrements or its frass. Um, some of the larvae, as they feed, they leave their excrement uh, in a line, sort of maybe along the middle of the mine, or many of them actually, they pack their frass, they pack their excrements at one end of the mine. And this is because they try to hide the fact from, from predators and other insect parasitoids that there's something feeding within the leaf. Because if a parasitoid finds out, uh, that larva will then be parasitized. There's a lot of, oh wow, there's a lot of scorpion flies here actually. It's the same taxon, I think. There's a male, and then nearby it is another male. I'm just resting there, and this is another male. At some point, we'll come across those big red ones. What an interesting thing I saw as I was passing by. So there were some ants uh, kind of walking along this bamboo here. But if you look closely, ants typically, if they're not on the ground, they might be essentially tending to some other insects. And what I mean by that is they're sort of hurting them. And they do so because they're feeding off of the excrements, which tend to be honeydew. And honeydew is produced by various hemipterans because the hemipterans feed on the plants. And there's so much water in the plant that they have to get rid of it fairly quickly. And it's gotten rid of in the form of a sweet tasting 
kind of honeydew. If you look under this leaf, you'll see the ants there. And they're tending to some hemipteran. I'm not sure exactly what it is. To look closer. It might be might be some scale insects. Need a microscope to be sure. Having trouble focusing on this one. Sorry about that. Hmm. Let's see if I can focus on something else first. They're just walking around in their little herd of um, scale insects. And they're, at the same time, they're protecting them. Okay, so the scale insects aren't bothered too much. They're not being eaten by the ants uh, because they are providing a sweet meal for the ants. Very cool. All right, guys. Came across cicada, but it's not quite in reach. Maybe I'll try to use my net to get it. Sitting up there and singing. Cicadas here tend to be uh, quite colorful and patterned. Their wings, uh, unlike most of the species in the U.S., uh, they're not just clear, uh, sort of, they're not unpigmented. They have various shades of brown and green and black. So, pretty interesting. Alright guys, I actually found a different species right here resting a little closer to the ground. Looks like a female. It's got a long ovipositor. Fairly long. And of course, like all cicadas, it both produces sound and it can hear sound. So they have uh, at the sort of the front anterior part of their abdomen. They have the sound producing structure which is called a timbal and that kind of functions like a bottle cap in a way. It's this thin uh, layer of cuticle that pops back and forth very quickly and it produces different sounds that way. And then they have their hearing organ called the tympanum which is this thin membrane, okay? And the curious thing about cicadas is that their hearing organ and their sound producing organ, so the timbal and tympanum, are adjacent to one another. I mean, they're right next to, they're situated right next to one another uh, on the body. So you have to wonder, you know, for that loud sound to be produced, does it interfere with its hearing at all? I'm not aware of any research that has been done to describe that, but you know you have to wonder about that. Also about the different sounds that cicadas make. They can make really different types of sounds. And so it's probably not only due to, say, the type of timbal it has. You know, it might be due to 
the various musculature that's present to snap that timbal back and forth rapidly. It may also have to do with the kind of the air sacs that are present behind the timbals that serve as these reverberating chambers. So these air pockets might be different in shape, which might contribute to different sounds as well. All right, here's a pair of those green acridids, those cone heads. And you see there's a smaller one on top of the other. So that's the male that's on top, kind of getting a free ride. And then the larger female on the bottom. And with insects, that's sort of typically the, the case, this, this size discrepancy. The females tend to be larger, uh, usually because it's, it's for purposes of you know, producing large egg masses, so they need a, a larger body. And the males essentially are just kind of sperm carriers that are wandering around um, to eventually fertilize the, the very important eggs that are in the female. Sometimes you'll see more than one male on top of the female. Um, obviously that doesn't work very well. And only one male will eventually uh, mate with the female. Here's another one of those green scarab beetles. Let's see if we can coax it out. There we go. Oh. Ooh, you see that? Ooh, that's not blood, that's uh, hemolymph. Well, it's insect blood. And sometimes they do that as a sort of escape mechanism. I'll let it go, actually. So it's probably, it's either just defecated on me as a defensive mechanism, or it's ejected some of its blood, its hemolymph. Just wipe that off. And well, maybe with that, <laughs> uh, we might call it a day. So I hope you've enjoyed this little insect hunt today, not a hunt but a viewing, and of course, you know, the important thing is to stay curious about the natural world. Uh, there's a lot of exciting, interesting creatures out there, and uh, hopefully I'll bring some more insects to you next time, alright, so I'll see you next time.